My title is, In Christ All Will Be Made Alive. Jesus Christ's death as the payment that ransoms every human being from death. <laughs> this paper is going to attempt the inconceivable, to introduce two new paradigms, one eschatological and one soteriological. We'll see that the new soteriological paradigm is entailed by the eschatological paradigm. So I'll begin by introducing and explaining the new eschatological paradigm. That paradigm is after the thousand years, resurrection and judgment in Revelation 20. I'm known among Revelation scholars for my 1992 monograph, After the Thousand Years, Resurrection and Judgment in Revelation 20. John Court called After the Thousand Years a tour de force. Gregory Beale, a respected Revelation commentator, said the new model of the millennium in After the Thousand Years had a viability that cannot henceforth be ignored by commentators, and he called it a methodological contribution without precedent and a new paradigm that deserves to be ranked alongside the major theories of the millennium. I'm going to introduce it to you now. The central concept behind the new paradigm is recapitulation. The idea is that John is shown multiple visions of the same eschatological realities, each of which contributes its own unique perspective. John sees Christ's coming in glory, for example, more than ten times, each vision revealing some new and complementary aspect of this history-shattering event. In Revelation 19, 17 through 23 is one such revelation. John sees Jesus coming in glory, which results in the capture of the beast and the false prophet and his slaying of the kings of the earth and their armies, followed by the rest of rebellious humanity, 1921. Then John sees an angel coming and capturing the devil, chaining him up and locking him in the prison of the underworld for a thousand years, quote, so that he will not be able to deceive the nations any longer, end quote. That's 21 to 3. The devil has, of course, up to this point, been 100% successful in deceiving all the nations, causing them to worship him through the beast, getting them to attack and kill all believers in Jesus, and in chapter 19, getting them to oppose Jesus and his faithful ones as they come in glory. That's the battle of Armageddon. John sets the term of the devil's imprisonment in these words, until the thousand years are ended. In Greek, this is akriteleste ta ete. John then sees another angle on Christ's coming in glory, this one also recalling Daniel 7. He sees thrones, as in Daniel 7, and the court sits and decrees resurrection and age-long reign for the faithful, most of them martyrs, and no resurrection for the rest of the dead, who will remain in the prison of the underworld of Hades until the thousand years are ended. In Greek, this is a, the exact same five-word phrase that John just used two verses ago to describe the term of the devil's imprisonment. The obvious inference is when the devil gets out of prison, they get out of prison, in their case, by resurrection. After all, Jesus says in Revelation 1, verse 18, I was dead, but see, I am alive forever and ever, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Where else in Scripture do we get this pattern? Human beings being co-imprisoned with the devil and presumably his angels for a very long time, starting at the moment of Christ's coming in glory. Actually, there are two places. The first is Isaiah 24, verses 21 to 23, which you see up there. On that day, the Lord will punish the host of heaven in heaven and the kings of the earth on the earth they will gather together in, as prisoners in a pit. They will be shut up in prison, and after many days they will be punished. And then the moon will be confounded and the sun ashamed, for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and his glory will be before his elders. In Revelation, when the Lord of hosts comes in glory, he comes with the Lamb, his son. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That's a Revelation 11, verse 15. Similarly, Jesus, in his earthly ministry, speaks of coming 
in the glory of his Father. That's Mark 8.38 and Matthew 16.27. And this leads us to the second passage that tells a similar story to Revelation 19, verses 17 through 20, verse 3. That his words in Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory with all his angels with him. Now note that his angels with him. The Lord of hosts is called the Lord of hosts because he is surrounded by hosts, that is, armies of angels. So Jesus, the Lord of hosts coming in glory in Isaiah 24, verse 23, and Jesus coming in his glory with all his angels with them, he's talking about the same thing. He will sit on his glorious throne. Verse 32, before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Here we have the Lord Jesus coming in glory with all of his angels and sending all those found unworthy of a part in the glorious kingdom into the same punishment, in this case styled eternal fire, as the devil and his angels. People unfamiliar with Greek assume that eternal, aeonios, is equivalent to everlasting, but it is not. Just like the Hebrew word olam in the Old Testament, it can mean lifelong, age-long, ancient, extremely long-lasting, or everlasting, depending on the context. Given that Jesus clearly alludes to Isaiah 24, verses 21 to 23, in Matthew 25, 31 and 41, as well as associating his coming in glory with God's coming in glory in the Isaiah apocalypse of Isaiah 24 to 26, in a number of other sayings, it seems well defensible to understand that the eternal fire and the eternal punishment to which Jesus refers in Matthew 25, 41 and 46 refer to the co-imprisonment of rebellious angels and humans in the fiery pit of the underworld for the entire messianic age. And that the parallel phrase eternal life refers to the granting of glorious resurrected life to the faithful for that age. That's verse 46. So our uh, speaker this morning was talking about symmetry between eternal life and eternal punishment. In this interpretation, the two are symmetrical. He's affirming that they will go into the Hades for punishment for that age, and the faithful will receive life for that age. Now, it's not to deny that they will also have life after that. In Daniel 7, it says, they will reign for the age and for the ages of the ages. So it's not a denial that, that eternal life turns out to be absolutely unending life. But what he is affirming there is in this age that is now dawning, the messianic kingdom age, these folks are going to go to Hades or to the underworld along with the devil and his angels. And these folks are going to receive the kingdom and reign. Jesus does not in that Matthew 25 passage go on to teach what happens after that age in this separation of the sheep and the goats passage. But John and Isaiah do. Let's look at John first. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they came up onto the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the pool of fire. The devil is released from the prison of the abyss when the thousand years are ended. And immediately sets out to deceive the unrepentant nations whom John calls Gog and Magog. He sees them as numberless hordes coming up onto the broad plain of the earth. That's the ancient cosmology there. The underworld, you cannot come up onto a plain unless you're underneath it. This, this is often mistranslated, but I won't get into that. This is the image. They are coming up onto the broad plain of the earth, and they surround uh, the holy city, and fire comes down from heaven and 
just consumes them, and the devil is thrown into the pool of fire that is created by the deluge. Right? So they are consumed by a river of fire, as in Daniel 7, right? A river of fire comes down from heaven, and the devil ends up getting thrown into the same pile that, uh, of, of fire. That's the image that I think is being made there. The devil and the unrepentant humanity, freed together from the prison of the underworld, have turned right around and headed toward the very same murderous violence that required God to end the first age of this present world with the flood and the last age of this world with Christ's coming in glory. But they don't get to do damage to God's world or God's people this time. John makes specific allusions to two passages in Isaiah in the context, and here they are. When your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. If favor is shown to the wicked, he does not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness, he deals corruptly and does not see the majesty of the Lord. O Lord, your hand is lifted up, but they do not see it. Let them see your zeal for your people and be ashamed. Let fire for your adversaries consume them. That's Re uh, Isaiah 26, 9 to 11, and it parallels Revelation 20, verse 9, because John alludes to it. As though to answer this prayer that Isaiah prays, a few verses later, Come, my people, enter into your inner rooms and shut the doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until fury has passed by. For behold, the Lord is coming out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity, and the earth will disclose the blood on, shed on it and will no longer cover its slain. Interesting. By reference to Isaiah 66, verses 22 to 24, where the corpses are seen burning on the surface of the ground. Uh, Isaiah goes on in 27, 1 to say this. In that day, the Lord, with his hard and great and strong sword, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. In that day, a pleasant vineyard, sing of it. I, the Lord, am its keeper. Every moment I water it, lest anyone damage it. I protect it night and day. I have no wrath. Will someone bring me thorns and briars to battle? I will march against them. I will burn them up together. Instead, let them lay hold of my protection. Let them make peace with me. Let them make peace with me. Right. John points us to these verses in a number of ways in Revelation chapter 20. We have right in the middle of these portions of Isaiah 26 to 27 an affirmation of rescue and resurrection for the faithful and destruction for, and refusal of resurrection for those who had oppressed them, closely paralleling Revelation 20, verses 4 to 5. O Lord our God, other lords besides you have ruled over us, but your name alone we bring to remembrance. They are dead, they will not live. Their shades, they will not arise. To that end you have visited them with destruction and wiped out all remembrance of them. Your dead will live, their bodies shall arise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. Your dew is a dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. So here we have refusal of resurrection for the oppressors, resurrection for the faithful. That's a few, few verses before that thing about Leviathan and the final confrontation between God and the unrepentant, in which God is pleading to them, be reconciled to me, make peace with me. I don't want to burn you up like so many thorns and briars. In, in my vineyard. Here is a crucial interpretive key to the relationship between John and Isaiah. When John sees something in a vision and he, he recognizes it as something God has previously revealed to another prophet, he crafts his description of his vision so as to signal the presence of a relationship. His allusions are scriptural cross-references that tell us, if you want to understand what I'm seeing here, you should read it alongside what Isaiah saw, because God has revealed the same reality to each of us. 
This being the case, John wants us to understand that Isaiah 26, verses 10 to 11, the one about, may fire come down and consume your enemies, and 26.20 to 27.5, uh, which we read a little more previously, are revelations of the same event that is revealed in Revelation 20, verses 7 to 10, the resurrection, judgment, and final fiery end of all unrepentant humanity along with the devil. The last judgment of the unrepentant comes when, after they have paid an appropriate penalty for their misdeeds in mortal life by being denied resurrection for the first age of the new creation, the kingdom age, they are granted the undeserved gift of resurrection life right before Isaiah prays that fire will consume your adversaries, he says, if favor is shown to the wicked, he does not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness, he deals corruptly and does not see the majesty of the Lord. What is the favor that is shown to the wicked? Since John points us to this passage as prophetic background to the fiery end of the resurrected unrepentant, the undeserved favor would appear to be the favor of resurrection. What is the blindness that causes the wicked not to see that they are in danger of being incinerated? It's the blindness of envy, covetousness, and self-deception that overtakes them when they allow themselves to be seduced again by the devil. They think they can take what they want by violence and force, just as they did in their mortal lives. But in the fully manifested kingdom of God, they are the vulnerable ones. They just don't know it. God says to them a few verses later, as we read above, I have no wrath. Will someone bring me thorns and briars to battle? I will march against them. I will burn them up completely. Instead, let them lay hold of my protection. Let them make peace with me. Let them make peace with me. Why does God have no wrath? Because those standing before the community of his beloved have already suffered the penalty for the sins they persisted in as mortals. They went down to Hades. Remember Capernaum, you will go down to Hades. They went down to Hades when Christ came in glory and spent many days as in uh, Isaiah 24, verse 22, symbolically a thousand years, languishing in the underworld while the faithful enjoyed the messianic banquet and the glories of the kingdom. They wept and gnashed their teeth at being locked outside of the celebration. That should remind you of a passage in Luke paralleled by Matthew, where it says, when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the saints in, in the kingdom of God and yourselves outside, you will weep and gnash your teeth. That's what the weeping and gnashing of teeth is. It's realizing you missed the party. And if any of you have teenage daughters, or have had teenage daughters, the most painful moment you'll ever see in their life is when you tell them you're grounded when they had a party that they thought they were going to. The excruciating pain of that is we know that in our own lives if, if we ever had daughters. I don't know what sons do, but I have daughters. Anyway. When they are raised, God bears no wrath towards them, but appeals to them to be reconciled to him. Twice he appeals to them to be at peace with him, but they don't want it, and their end is fiery destruction. This story of the end of the unrepentant differs from typical eschatology of both conditional immortality camp and the everlasting conscious torment camp. First, it posits that the punishment for unrepentant sin in mortal life takes place before rather than after resurrection. In fact, refusal of resurrection life at the dawning of the fully manifested kingdom of God and Christ, plus painful awareness of what they are missing, is the essence of the punishment. But this in turn implies that the later granting of resurrection to those refused resurrection at the dawning of the kingdom is an act of grace and not simply a means of making people available for judgment and punishment. Finally, those who experience a fiery end when they are resurrected do so because of their actions as resurrected people. They show themselves incorrigible, and thus God's protective love demands that they be removed from the community of creation. 
In this story of the end, annihilationism makes good theological sense as well as exegetical sense. The consequences of remaining in unrepentant sin in mortal life are revealed to be severe, but not infinite. And the attempt to attack the faithful in the New Jerusalem justly merits instant and irrevocable destruction. So that's the eschatological paradigm I'm looking at. Now let's spend a moment looking at some passages that don't make sense on any other model. I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. This is the great white throne judgment that Christians are familiar with. And the books were opened, and then another book was opened, which is the book of life. Then the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Famous Revelation commentator R.H. Charles was so sure something was wrong with these verses that he literally said they're just incorrect. His problem was that verse 12 has people being judged before they are brought out of the realms of death. And then 13 has them brought out and judged all over again. Something's fouled up here. But what if this scene is a recapitulation, a new vision of Revelation 20 verses 4 to 10? The unrepentant dead are judged on the basis of what they did in mortal life by what was written in the books. Verse 12, and then they are raised and judged by what they do in resurrection. Verse 13, it is from God's perspective one judgment with two phases. But what of this idea that living a life of unrepentant sin leads to long but limited imprisonment in Hades? Here's another passage that makes no sense on any other model. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out of there until you've paid the last penny. This passage comes right in the middle of a section teaching by Jesus that explicitly concerns future judgment. It's not good advice on how to deal with your legal problems. He's talking about the judgment that's coming. Neither the everlasting torment model nor the annihilationist model has room for the notion that you will ever get out at all. Jesus says some will go down to Hades at the coming judgment, where the standard model would expect them to come up from there in order to be judged. But Jesus teaches that the coming judgment at the transition between this age and the age to come determines not what to do with resurrected people, but whether people are to be resurrected. Jesus is explicit in this verse, Luke 20, verses 35 to 36. Those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from among the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Jesus, in referring to those who are considered worthy, automatically assumes that a judgment takes place prior to resurrection and determines who will be resurrected from among the dead, just as in Revelation 20, verses 4 to 5. In both cases, some are raised to incorruptible life and others are left unresurrected. I wish I could spend some time talking about this phrase, from among the dead. It's usually translated from the dead. And think, people think the dead is some kind of condition. The word dead there in Greek is plural, okay? So it means the people who are dead. He is raised from among the dead. Just like over and over again in the New Testament, it affirms of Jesus, he was raised from the dead. He was not raised from a condition of death. That is a misunderstanding of what the Greek is saying. It is, he was raised from among the dead. They stay down there, he comes up. So in Luke chapter 20, verses, uh, 35 and 36, is it? He's speaking of who is found worthy to be raised from among the dead, to take part in the kingdom age and the immortality uh, and incorruptibility of that age. So, 
Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 21 to 24 are hotly contested, but notice the new sense that they make when read in this eschatological paradigm. For as by a man came death, by a man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive, in each in his own cohort. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. How can all people be made alive in Christ without all belonging to Christ? Well, if resurrection life is a gift given to all, including the unrepentant, then it is given through the resurrection life power that is in Christ. He, as we have seen in Revelation 1 verse, verse 18, I have the keys to death and Hades, claims the authority and the power to release people, good and bad, faithful and unrepentant, from prison of death and Hades. Similarly, in John 5, 21 to 29, Jesus claims both the authority and the life power through the Father to call forth from death every person who dies, good and bad alike. As the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, so shall the Son gives life to whom he will. Truly I say to you, a moment is coming and is here now when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. As the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. Do not marvel at this, for a moment is coming when all those who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to a resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to a resurrection of judgment. Jesus here emphasizes his agency and the qualitative difference between the two resurrections without mentioning a temporal distinction. We only learn elsewhere, as in Luke 20, verses 35, that there is a unique resurrection to incorruptible life at Christ's coming in glory. As Paul says of himself in Philippians 3, 10, and 11, his hope is not merely hope of resurrection as such, but rather that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the out-resurrection from among the dead. That is, you couldn't get clearer than that. He wants to be resurrected from among the dead, out from among the dead. Like Jesus in Luke 20, verse 35, Paul here speaks in terms of resurrection from among the dead, a resurrection that leaves those who do not attain to it dead. It's sometimes argued that if Revelation 20 verses 1 to 6 pictures what happens when Jesus comes in glory, it would be the only biblical passage affirming a thousand year age between the resurrection of the faithful and resurrection of everyone else. But that's a straw man. If we content ourselves with looking for passages in the Bible that posit a resurrection exclusively for the faithful when the kingdom dawns in its full glory and no resurrection for everyone else, Suddenly, we have six passages that fit the bill. Isaiah 26, verses 13 to 19, which we read. Luke 14, 14, which talks about, uh, then you'll be able to uh, be raised at the resurrection of the righteous. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 to 24. Philippians 3, 10 to 11. And Revelation 20, verses 1 to 6. Under the paradigm I'm introducing, they all sit comfortably together. So incidentally do Revelation 19 verses 6 to 9 and 21, 1 to 4. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. But notice how there's a intimate connection between Revelation 21 and the revelation of the bride 
and the announcement of the wedding in chapter 19. The new creation and the coming of the new, uh, new Jerusalem belong with Christ's coming in glory. The wedding happens then, not later. So, but what that, what that implies is that the, the scene of Agog and Magog and that attack happens in the context of the new creation. And if that sounds odd to you, what do you think of this? For as the new heavens and the new earth that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name remain from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath. All flesh shall come to worship me, declares the Lord, and they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who rebelled against me. Their worm shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be in abhorrence to all flesh. The same scene as we saw in Isaiah 26 and 27 is here in Isaiah 66, explicitly in the new creation. The last encounter between God and the unrepentant takes place when they are raised and offered a place in the new creation and they turn around and turn back to their violent ways and must be destroyed for the protection of the beloved. That's my story of the end. That's the new paradigm of reading Revelation and Isaiah together. So I'm going to go on to what does this imply for our understanding of atonement? Whose sins did Jesus expiate by dying on the cross? John the Baptist's testimony is that Jesus will take away, that is expiate, the sin of the whole world. The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is an unqualified statement. And it becomes the more striking when we consider that the world, who cosmos, in the Gospel and Epistles of John, almost always are a technical term for corporate humanity in a state of hostile self-alienation from God. Paul speaks in equally universal terms when he compares Adam's sin with Christ's gift of atonement. I'm going to just... Skip down here. Let you look at that for a moment. We're behind time. But notice that where he starts talking about the many, he then says all men. So the many turns out to be all. He's pantas anthropus. Christ made a, an act of justification that applies to all people. You have to work really hard to figure out a way in which that does not apply to everyone. He goes on to speak of, in Adam all die, so in Christ will all be made alive. That's another contested passage. And then in 2 Corinthians, this was, this was in 1 Corinthians written in the spring of the same year that he wrote Romans. So he's thinking about these things. And then, just a couple months before he wrote Romans, he writes a portion of 2 Corinthians, in which he says, the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might not live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. It would have been very simple for Paul to say that Christ died for us, that we who live might not longer live for ourselves, but he does not. He says that Christ died for all. In fact, it rather sounds like Paul is making the radical claim that God in Christ did not choose to impose mortality upon all humanity without first determining to share in mortality himself and to face death on behalf of every mortal. Thus he goes on to speak of the scope of Christ's work as encompassing the world. God in Christ was re reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. This is some of the most radical theologizing that Paul does, and it shows what was in his mind as he was preparing to write Romans. In 1 Timothy, Paul affirms, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, 
which is the testimony given at the proper time. Much effort is made to avoid the apparent universality of this statement. The thinking is, whoever is ransomed is saved from what they would have had to pay. Since many human beings pay the eternal penalty for their sins, Christ cannot have ransomed them. But if Christ, by dying for all without exception, ransoms all from death without exception, believers and unrepentant sinners alike, by his grace, then it is true that he is the ransom for all. As Jesus says to John when he appears to him in the first chapter of Revelation, fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys to death and Hades. Jesus is affirming that he has the authority and the power to release people from the prison of death and Hades, a claim that we saw he made also in John 5. And he's tying his authority and power to the fact that he died and has overcome death and to live forever and ever. If it were not for the grace of God in Christ Jesus, no mortal person would receive resurrection life. In the same letter to Timothy in which Paul said that Christ is the ransom for all, he also says, God our Savior desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Many interpreters have the same problem with this statement as with other statements to the effect that God through Christ is, has an intention or plan to save everyone. They use the same tactics to avoid its implications. The reasoning main, remains purely deductive. If God really wanted all people to be saved, they would be. If not all are saved, then Paul cannot be saying that God wants all people to be saved no matter what his words appear to be saying. But suppose all people are going to be saved from the grave. What if even the stubbornly unrepentant are going to be given the undeserved grace of resurrection and with it an, a genuine invitation to make peace with God and an opportunity to take part in the glories of the new creation and the kingdom of God? Would that not be a very significant, indeed priceless, gift of salvation no matter what the unrepentant ones did with it? Paul says later in the same letter, to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the savior of all people, especially those who believe. I won't belabor the point, but Paul seems clearly to be saying that God is the savior of all while granting that God is savior in a stronger sense in relation to believers. Let's now look at what some other New Testament writers have to say about the intended scope of Christ's death. The author of Hebrews says this, we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he may taste death for everyone. That sounds a whole lot like 2 Corinthians 5 that we just read. It is true that the author goes on to speak of how Jesus became like his brothers and sisters, sharing the human experience and the human temptation all the way to the point of death. In other words, Christ humbled himself to stand on level ground with those whom he redeemed. But one would never think to restrict the sense of everyone simply because the author goes on to focus on Christ's relationship with the redeemed. It is the implicit theological problem of Christ dying for every person, namely the assumption that this seems logically to entail universal salvation to everlasting life that forces an awkward, restrictive sense onto the word. John says of Jesus, he is the propitiation or the expiation for our sins and not ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Once again, the logic of who is and is not ultimately saved tells interpreters that John can't be saying Jesus is the propitiation or expiation for the whole world, despite the fact that John specifically adds the whole world to our sins, making it inescapable that the whole world includes everyone and not just believers. Peter says, false prophets arose among the people just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. 
Peter affirms that even heretics headed for destruction were bought, i.e. ransomed, by Christ. Similarly, the author of Hebrews says, If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains the sacrifice of sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. This is a quotation of Isaiah 26, verses 10 to 11 that I read to you earlier. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? It appears that he's saying Christ has provided a sacrifice for sins that sanctifies even those who come to understand the truth but turn back to unrepentant sinning. He warns that the status of acceptance with God, which Christ Jesus' self-offering provided, does not cover willful and persistent sin after reception of the truth and sprinkling with the sanctifying blood of Christ. The author's allusion to Isaiah 26 suggests that there is an eschatological side to this warning. When your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. If favor is shown to the wicked, he does not learn righteousness. In the land of the uprightness, he deals corruptly and does not see the majesty of the Lord. Lord, your hand is lifted up, but they do not see it. Let them see your zeal for your people and be ashamed. Let fire for your adversaries consume them. Eschatologically speaking, Isaiah is affirming that all the inhabitants of the earth are going to learn the truth about God's righteousness at the coming judgment. The new and every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. Right? New Testament writers certainly agree that every human being will suddenly realize the full truth when Jesus comes in his glory as judge of the living and the dead. But Isaiah sees that the wicked, when they are shown the grace subsequent to God's judgment, will demonstrate they have not truly learned righteousness. Their core motivation has not changed. They're destined to attempt the very behaviors that brought God's judgment down on the inhabitants of the world in the first place. But turning back to sin after being granted grace at the eschatological judgment will not simply result in further extensions of grace. This time, fire will come down from God and incinerate them before they can do any harm to God's faithful ones. Saved out of the first death by the grace of God in Christ Jesus, released from the prison of death in Hades, they violate the probation granted them by grace, and they end up in the consuming fire of the second death. Christ truly died for all, and all are truly saved but only those who at the deepest level allow themselves to be reconciled to God and their fellow human beings through Christ make it safe to everlasting life from this salvation. My title was, In Christ All Will Be Made Alive. Jesus Christ's death as the payment that ransoms every human being from death. I've demonstrated in the first part of this paper that a careful co-reading of Revelation 20 and Isaiah 26 and 27 leads to the understanding that the resurrection of the dead, even in the case of those ultimately de destined to be permanently removed from the creation, is given to them as a gift. And I have demonstrated in the second part of this paper that there are many, six or more passages in, in the New Testament that affirm the universal scope of the expiation made by Jesus Christ and the ransom that he made when he died for the sins of the world. Jesus Christ is indeed the Savior who rescues every human being from death by dying for everyone. What do they do with an incalculably precious gift determines whether they will experience unending and incorruptible life. I end with a question. Is it possible that God is this generous? Questions? Yeah, it's on. Uh, I'll start and then we'll see if folks have some questions here. And 
it's really a two-part question that I'd like to ask you. In your eschatology, I want to make sure I'm understanding correctly. Uh, what you're positing is that the new creation is the Lord Jesus coming in His glory, establishing the kingdom which is to come, not yet here. And during that thousand year kingdom, Satan and those who have died without Christ are in prison. In, in the prison. underworld. They're in, in the, the underworld, underworld together. Yes. In, together. Okay, so in my background growing up, the name for that typically is premillennialism. I'm a premillennialist, okay. yes. Just checking, to double yes. check. And then what you're saying is, at the end of the millennium, as Jesus, who holds the keys to death and to Hades, unlocks it, and the underworld comes to live in the kingdom, they rebel, uh, but it's an act of grace. I appreciate your presentation, where you've come from. I think I fully comprehend it and understand mm -hmm. your position. They don't deserve to get out of there at all. Now, I understand. What you're saying is, contrary to Calvin and others who speak of limited atonement or particular redemption, Christ redeemed. The entire human race, and that from the from the grave, from the grave, yes, that redemption is seen in the resurrection. So here's my question. Uh, that was all to make sure I was understanding correctly. Is it possible in your theology, in your eschatology, for the wicked who were not in Christ, who tasted of the first death, but were redeemed from the grave? by a generous God, mm -hmm. when they are raised at the end of the millennium, to see and enjoy the kingdom, is it possible in your eschatology for some of them to see the objective beauty of the mm -hmm. king mm -hmm. and be redeemed forever? In principle, yes. I think John and Isaiah are warning us that we should not hope for that. I, I would love that to be the case, obviously. Uh, Isaiah 57. I'm going to have to put my glasses on after taking them off. Isaiah 60, 57 is the second place in Isaiah where he, there, God reaches out and says, Peace, peace, twice to the wicked. It says... I will not accuse forever, nor will I always be angry. For then the spirit of man would grow faint before me, the breath of man I have created. I was enraged by his sinful greed. I punished him and hid my face in anger. This is the millennium, when they're in Hades, when everybody else is having a party. I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will guide him and restore comfort to him creating praise on the lips of the mourners in Israel. We were talking about, what about our loved ones? When God says, even those who rejected me and who harmed you, uh, I'm going to give them another chance, that will create praise because even if they will not accept the chance, even if they will throw the chance away, it will still be a blessing a revelation of God's generosity that they will praise God for. I think everyone in this room, or maybe nearly everybody in this room, would praise God if it turned out this was what he had in mind. That even those who are stubbornly unrepentant will be given one last opportunity, a genuine opportunity, before they are removed irrevocably from creation. And then it says, peace. Peace. I'm reading the very next verse after creating praise on the lips of the mourners of Israel. Peace, peace to those who far and near, says the Lord, and I will heal them. But the wicked are like the tossing sea which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. I'm afraid that the news is not good. I. Uh, but, but 
In principle, if let me put it this way, in my theology, the, speaking theologically, Christ's death does not have a shelf life. Period. It is everlasting. If anyone at any time said, you know, I've had it with trying to live on my own and I want to learn how to live in love, God will welcome them and Christ will welcome them. He paid for their sins. This idea that, you know, sorry, too late, you can repent all you like now, but never mind, it's too late. That contradicts Ezekiel 18 and 32 or whatever it is, where he says, uh, I don't desire the death of the wicked, but that they would turn from their ways and live. It doesn't matter how bad you've been, how much you've screwed up, how much damage you've done. If you repent and turn to me, I, my heart is to accept you. So that all works in my eschatological scheme. I got it. I want to come on up. Uh, just a quick question. What, what about where it says every knee shall bow and every tongue confess? Yes. So that is a verse from Isaiah 2 which Paul quotes in Philippians, I think it is, uh, everyone is going to acknowledge that, God is that it, God's love and justice is true. When Jesus comes in glory, everyone will get the picture. It may be searingly painful for them, but they will get the picture. And they will know that the fact that they have been refused resurrection based on their unworthy actions in life, right, uh, make them like, they, wouldn't, they, don't, they haven't played well with others, so they're being put in the penalty box for an age. They'll know that that is just, they'll know that's fair, and they will know that it's not forever. So they're being given a prison term. So I don't see every every knee will bow and every tongue confesses being that everyone will be reconciled to God. They will understand that God is just. Uh, that's yeah, as far as I go with it. We've got some, uh, yes sir. How about the ma microphone? Yeah, come on, yeah, good mic. So I was hoping that you could clarify the Greek of 2 Peter 2. Um, yep. Where it's talking about the uh, pseudo propheta and the pseudo Damascus. Okay. Um, and it says they're denying the master that bought them. Yep. And the term for master there is despot. Okay. So. It's a normal, normal term for a master. Yeah. Is there another term for someone who redeems someone as, uh, who bought them. So uh, when we talk about redemption, mm -hmm. uh, that's usually the, the sense in which someone is bought. Like, Absolutely. Yes. Uh, redemption means buying. And in particular, it means buying someone who is in debt and can't get out of debtor's prison. You go and you pay their debt, and now they get to come out. So the, uh, the debts of human beings subject them to going to death, right? The wages of sin is death. People end up in Hades. Jesus dies for them and he opens the doors. He's the one who, because he died, has the authority to open the gates or the doors of the prison of Hades and release people. And uh, the, so, uh, so how does that relate to Second Peter? So it seems to me that, that um, the master who bought them, the, the despot who, who bought them, is a different. It's a different relationship than the kind of redemption where the where the bride is redeemed. Um, am I am I just am I wrong about the implications of despot then? I don't know about brides being redeemed, but anyone who has the money can redeem somebody. He he's the master. He's the Lord and Master, right? Kyrios is Lord and Despotis is, is Master. And he just happens to use that term. And he has the authority to purchase them or not to purchase them. In fact, it says that he has purchased them. Thank you. You bet. Another question? Would you? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure I totally agree with you, but I really like your eschatology, because for me, 
philosophically, I'm not going to go into the scripture reason, mm -hmm. but philosophically it answers a couple of hard questions that I've had. For instance, a person that lived in India 2,000 years ago never heard Christ. Do they have any, any way to be saved? Well, your eschatology actually gives them a way, and anyone else in any other circumstance where they would not have had the opportunity to, to reach Christ or to, to be even here of Christ, for that matter. So, in addition to the second chance of those who might have heard, heard Christ and rejected him, um, I understand that someone who's unrepentant may be unrepentant in the future, but I, and so I'm going to have to really think about what you've said, but I, I thank you for mm. introducing it, because it does give me a lot to think about, because that's a question I've grappled with. You know, what about the person who lives on a desert island who's never heard of Christ? Is right. he automatically lost? Mm. Yeah. This would get Those are tough way. questions. Yeah. Yeah, uh, follow up, and we have some more. This is a really good discussion. I love a conference like this where different ideas are floated around and we can discuss it. Here's, here's my next question. Uh, in the coming of the kingdom, when those who are dead uh, are in, in prison, but then they're raised to life at the end, uh, you made the statement and I agree with, the atonement of Christ doesn't have a shelf life. Right. Except for the fact, I'd like your opinion, at the time that you read in Revelation 20, at the end of the millennium, when the unredeemed are raised to life and then they reject the kingdom a second time, and Satan and his angels and the wicked, as Isaiah points mm -hmm, out, mm -hmm. are then cast into the lake of fire, mm -hmm. Would you not then say the atonement of Christ, shelf life, has ended because, or I don't know, those who are cast in... I understand what you're saying. It's somewhat problematic terminology. Christ died to save people from their sins in mortal life and to redeem them from the grave. Okay? He didn't die to save people from the second death. Okay? So it's not like his, what he died for no longer works. It's that he died for those specific purposes. So that any person who repents of their sins can be forgiven and the devil can say anything he likes and he has no claim in the court of God's justice anymore. The repentant person, Jesus Christ, the just is the propitiation for our sins and not only ours but the sins of the whole world. Uh, and that's in the court of God's justice. So you would hold to annihilationism yes. in the second death? Yes. Good. Sadly. I mean, I would like to, one can sort of keep a tiny crack of light open there, maybe, that at any time, that's, I mean, that's as much I would definitely affirm. At any time, if any created being turns away from living destructively, they will be received with glory, glory and love. And, and then I don't mean to monopolize, but this will be my last, I promise. In that intermediate state of Hades and the unrepentant there, in what capacity are they chained? It, is it a soulless, or excuse me, a bodiless soul, immaterial, hell, or in what form? <laughs> yeah, we're not told these things. The ancient cosmology is you're, uh, a shade of you is down in the underworld. So you look like a ghost. You're recognizable as yourself, but you look like a ghost. This is a way of thinking about a condition between death and resurrection. I'm not like Chris. Chris uh, is a physicalist. He thinks when you're dead, you're just, there, you're no place. But uh, this model requires the idea that there is consciousness between, or potentially consciousness between death and resurrection, and how that works is God's business, not mine. It's above my pay grade. Yeah, mine too. Good. Other questions? Yes, sir. We need a mic for all the questions. What does the millennium? I don't... Yeah. The millennium begins in this model when Jesus comes in glory. Okay. As which, will be, which will be when? Uh, let... <laughs> I can't count. I can't calculate the day and the hour. Sometimes soon, very possibly. 
Well, yeah, yeah, because he's a premillennial, so he wouldn't be able to. We're talk not about living that. in the millennium. He handle yeah. in this generation. Uh, I've written a paper on that, which you can, um, which you can download from the internet. See me afterwards. Uh, it's a little complex. I'm a Bible scholar, and I've looked at it in detail. And I've written a paper, actually, which is publishable, but I just haven't gone around to it. Let's put it this way. To put it in just one, it's almost impossible to put really quickly. If you look at the expression generation, and in particular this generation, both in the Old Testament, in Hebrew, and in the Greek of the Septuagint, and in the Gospels, this generation is always negative. It talks about people who are stubborn and unrepentant, who are among the people of God, but who are stubborn and unrepentant. Okay, so uh, I think it means, and it also has a what I would say, what I'd call a trans-historical character. Uh, Jesus says the sins all the way from all the way from innocent Abel, all the way to Zechariah so-and-so, will be counted against this generation. He's not saying, hey, guess what? God is going to unjustly load on you people living right here now all of those other sins. He's saying that this generation is, has a trans-historical, mystical uh, community of people who are among the people of God, but they, their attitude is totally wrong. They are not trusting God. They are actually hostile to God's purposes and hostile to God secretly. This generation, this, this tendency of people among the people of God to be rejectors of God, will this dynamic will continue until he comes in glory. It is not talking about a 30-year generation. That is a very crude misreading in my view. Yes, ma'am. Give her a microphone, would you please? I just want to make sure I understand that sure. at the at the return of Christ in the pre right at the beginning of the premillennial, mm -hmm. then the wicked will go to Hades. Correct. We'll spend the time in Hades, and at the end, then that's like a second chance. Where absolutely, I mean, it, it, God's grace. evangelicals are very hostile usually to the notion of a second chance, but that's explicitly what it is. Okay. They did not make it to the glorious first age of the everlasting kingdom. Okay, and so then at that point there will be some that will be saved and then there will I be some. I don't affirm that. I just read to you from Isaiah 57 where the news does not appear to be good. Okay, so at that point they'll still reject God. That's what I think I'm reading and I would love to be found wrong. I would love to be found wrong. I'm very visual and process oriented so I'm just trying to kind of put it in steps. Yes. Thank you. Good. Good question. By the way, my friend Paul Young believes the same thing. He says all human beings will be restored, and the angel and the devil are the ones that will be destroyed. Well, I just want to make a point. The term this generation forever. Say it again. He said he wanted to make a point. The term this generation could be forever. Well, Jesus says it will not pass away until all these things take place, and I think he's talking about his coming in glory, so I think it ends then. Mm -hmm. Oh, well. I know. You, you could have an interesting point. I'll have to think about it. Yeah. Good. Good discussion. Other questions? Yes, sir. Tim. Did he not say the previous chapter? Hey, Tim, let's do it for the... Sorry. Yeah. Did he not say in the previous chapter there would be some standing here in this crowd? We'll see these things happen. Uh, I believe that's the chapter before that, chapter... I think he's... 23. I think that's... 24. He says, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom coming in his glory. Okay. Something to that effect. Right. Well, how long did they live? Well, I mean, there's two there's possibilities. There, they that is a tough there. verse. Um, that, I mean, there's a couple possibilities. It's conceivable that some actually were translated. I don't know that. I mean, I don't have any positive evidence for that. But secondly, it may be that he's referring to what's about to happen on the Mount of Transfiguration. I can't say I'm totally, um, I, I can't say I'm totally satisfied by that. Yes. I'd just like to clarify, reference to the last question. 
And you mentioned a transfiguration. So you're, am I correct in, in understanding that your one possibility at least is that during the time when the three accompanied Jesus to the Mount of Olives and saw the vision. They, they saw him in his fact, full glory. Yeah, that was in fact seeing the kingdom in, in the its vision? In its glory. Okay, thank you. I, I can't say I'm totally, um, you know, satisfied with that, but that's the best answer I can give. Where did you learn your Greek? I went to Westmont College in Santa Barbara, California, and I studied Greek with, uh, with uh, Robert Gundry and uh, Moses Silva. Good for you. And uh, I kept on studying. I took every course I could, and when I ran out of courses, at that time I had to uh, get a self-study course with Dr. Gundry, and so I took more. I kept, and so I've been reading the Greek New Testament for 45 years or something. Well, I'm too intimidated now. I can ask a question. <laughs> Okay, so does it say that um, to, to God um, uh, one day is like a thousand years? And a thousand years is a day. So, I mean, we could extrapolate that out as to time frame, you know, for generations. But um, that's not really my question. Um, where does the tribulation fit into this? It comes right before Jesus comes in glory. And, and speaking of that, a thousand years is one day. The age to come is pictured as a thousand years. I don't know whether it'll be literally a thousand years or not. It doesn't really matter. The point is, some people find themselves excluded from the beautiful messianic banquet, and they know that they didn't deserve it, and their remorse is the punishment that they experience. They're not tortured forever and ever and ever by one means or another. They're given a fair, uh, Severe in some ways, but not infinite punishment. Boy, that was very good. We're out of time. Thank you all for your questions. Yeah, yeah thanks for the, the really good engaged questions, folks. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I've just written a book. Let me see if I can find it on here. All right, so my new book is called New Creation Millennialism. There's little three little business card style things that tell you how to order it. And um, this, that lays out the whole uh, eschatological model that you've seen me present here in a big hurry today. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you.